What's your name, please? Mark Thurston. Is it okay to use this uh, interview uh, online and on sure. TV? Yes. Yeah, my permission. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, we just saw a screening of a movie about a Jewish veteran Medal of Honor winners. What's your connection? In what way are you connected with the Jewish war veterans? I am the California senior vice commander. I'm the number two commander in the state. I'm also a post commander for a post that's here in the valley. And additionally, I'm, a, uh, I'm an accredited veteran service officer for the Jewish war veterans. I'm essentially franchised by Jewish war veterans. And I have an office at a health care center here in the San Fernando Valley in North Hills, the Sepulveda Health Care Center. And I have an office. Now, outwardly, you don't appear Jewish, but when you uh, deal with, uh, you say, you're, you're, are you part Jewish? Uh, it's Jewish on my mother's side. So I'm part Jewish Catholic. Old Testament, New Testament. Did you, did you follow uh, these stories about uh, anti-Semitism that I guess the older guys experienced more, but e even in Vietnam? No. Um, anti-Semitism was never an issue that I dealt with. Um, really for most of my, I would say my childhood and certainly early adulthood, um, I was mm, perhaps more Catholic than anything else, although it wasn't a big thing. Religion wasn't central to my life. I, I would say that, that experiences of awakening and revelation because of my experiences in Vietnam were, but um, I, I didn't follow religion with a fervor. But as I've gotten older, things change. And I became very attracted to Judaism because of um, a sense of family and tradition. I hate to sound like Tevia, but you know, tradition became very important to me as I got older. And I found that to be a hallmark, uh, of, of really the gist and the center of Judaism is family and tradition. And I really like that. I found a sense of family uh, among Jewish people that I didn't with, uh, with Christian Catholic. It was just different. Do you feel that the Jews also, uh, or Jewish veterans, need your help more? That, that, that they have other kinds of issues? Not necessarily. They all have the same issue. Uh -huh. Uh, they all have injuries from service, and there's ground on which we might relate a little more, but it's, it's really negligible. The most important thing is the fact that they served their country and they were injured doing it, uh, either physically or mentally or both, and it's on, it's on that level that we relate to each other. Paul Cohen, a 95-year-old, I think he's a post commander, JWV post commander, and also yes. uh, a World War II veteran, seems like he's still experiencing PTSD from the anti-Semitic humiliation he experienced from Southern officers during World War II. To, uh, to what extent is PTSD an issue for, for uh, Vietnam veterans? Well, PTSD has been an issue for all veterans of war since time began. PTSD is something that occurs, is, 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 a, is a host of, of um, psychological, debilitating psychological traits, uh, from anxiety to depression, uh, particularly um, perhaps suicidal thoughts, any number of things that alienate you from others. Um, that move you away from others, make you feel uncomfortable with people and situations. Um, these are things that, that uh, most soldiers have experienced since time began. Mm -hmm. And we found different terms and words for it, uh, shell shock, combat shock, combat fatigue. Um, after the Vietnam War, uh, Dr. Shad Mishad, who I work with, uh, was one of those who developed the term post-traumatic stress disorder mm -hmm. to bring together a collection of symptoms 
as being the hallmarks of having been in life-threatening situations where you had the constant anxiety and fear of dying 24-7 mm -hmm. uh, for long periods of time. The thing that makes PTSD so characteristic to Vietnam veterans and now to Gulf War veterans is the fact that um, in war since the Second World War, um, soldiers have been exposed to combat for longer periods of time. You're just out there 24-7 and you don't come back in. And so you're always on guard, always on alert. You never stand down mentally. Mm -hmm. And because of that, your mind never learns how to relax when you're young. So when you deal with anything, you know, a letter from the IRS to a letter, you know, from a family member in trouble or, or traffic stop on the 405 freeway, you go from zero to 60. Mm -hmm. There are no intermediate gears. Everything is just you ramp up really quick, you, you're anxious, you get angry, you have all of these things going on inside, which are not usual normal human reaction and behavior. Why do we see so many Vietnam vets in m mental conditions uh, living a, a crazy either drug lives or homeless lives when there's the VA benefit supposed to benefit th uh, uh, take care of them? Well, the thing to understand about Vietnam veterans more than veterans I think of any other war is that Vietnam veterans fought two wars. We fought a war overseas, which everyone reviled, and then everyone reviled us for fighting the war that our country sent us to fight, so we fought a war at home. And it uh, essentially uh, kind of um, put us out there in the wilderness. You know, if, if I could find any analogy to explain Vietnam veterans particularly, mm -hmm. um, I remember reading once that among Native American culture, the worst thing that could happen to a Native American was to be banished from his tribe. That was worse than death. The tribe was everything, to be a part of the tribe. You fought for the tribe. Your whole existence, your sense of purpose and being uh, came from being a member of the tribe. So if you were banished from the tribe, you were nothing. Mm -hmm. And I think that many of us, perhaps most of us Vietnam veterans, felt after the war that we were banished from the tribe, that a losing war was placed on us, that um, we were looked down upon for having served and fought for our country, and it was just more than most of us could handle. And because of that, for many guys, uh, drug addiction, um, not trusting in family and country and normal community activities, things, religion, um, they were just out of reach. The, the, you, you didn't believe in it anymore. You didn't trust anything or anyone, except perhaps a fellow veteran. And so that's why veterans, you know, uh, there are any number of veterans that are homeless and they won't come in from the cold. They don't trust being in government housing. They don't want the VA. They don't want anything from the government. They just want to be left alone. I saw a guy on the VA property um, who was rambling to himself, nuts, uh, almost dangerous to, to people who walk by. Won't the VA treat him? Well, the VA may, may have tried to treat him, but maybe there isn't any treatment for him. Also, perhaps he may not be in treatment. Perhaps he's just wandering in from under a bridge abutment, you know, or underneath a freeway overpass near the VA over on the west side or over in Sepulveda. The wonderful thing about having the VAs is that they are a safe harbor and veterans can come in in any condition and the rest of us vets accept vets for who they are. We understand there's a part of you that gets it. We're all just a footstep away from being there ourselves and many of us have had to fight hard not to be that person who's just mumbling, rambling to himself, wandering around the VA. And so you understand. And uh, I, I have to tell you that people talk about privatization of the VA. The thing that worries me the most is that they've closed down so many hospitals, which are safe centers. 
when I go to the VA where I work, I'll see veterans gather together in circles, talking. You know, they'll be under an umbrella. They'll be sitting in chairs, smoking and rapping, you know, however you, you know, chatting with each other. They feel safe. This is a place for them to be. It's their, it, it's their ground, and they feel safe here. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what makes the VA unique, is that safe harbor for veterans. But as a service officer, are you uh, essentially like a, a defense attorney for, on, for a patient's rights? Well, yeah, if you will. If you will, that, that's, that's a reasonable way to... Uh, to patient's uh, advocate? I'm, I'm an advocate. You know, I'm, I, I'm a patient's advocate. I help the veteran uh, who has a disability claim to assemble his, um, his claim, his medicals, to make the most effective case to maximize um, his rights, you know, what, what he's earned. I, I I characterize a case in the VA as, as a three-legged stool. You know, your case is like a stool with three legs. One leg is disability, is having, a, or excuse me, one leg is a diagnosis of illness or injury. And so the diagnosis is, is your first leg. Second leg is, is a complete description of the disability which flows from that diagnosed illness. And then finally the third leg is service connecting it is connecting it to your service. And uh, so you have to have all three legs, otherwise the stool falls over and you land on your, on your, uh, your tush, your stuckus. Uh -huh. Now, it's interesting because some wouldn't believe that, that a, a, a fellow who served as an army ranger could later in life be such an empath. And empathetic and sympathetic and uh, like a psychologist, which is a sounds sounds like is a big part of what you do now. Yeah, a lot of it is that way. I have to. People come into my office uh, with their hands out, looking for hope, and I have to fill their hands up with hope. I have to show them that there's somebody that cares, and that I'm that person, and that the VA is the second largest bureaucracy in government. And it's unwieldy, and sometimes it's unfair. Sometimes it's very, most of the time it's pretty fair. And if you assemble the right case, and you have legitimate injuries, and they truly are service-connected, um, there may be mistakes along the way, and your case may be fouled up by the VA, and you may have to appeal it, but that's what people like me do. And they help a veteran organize it in a way that will maximize um, their opportunity to receive whatever benefit they deserve. And uh, so a lot of what I do is being kind of a psychologist with people. Mm -hmm. I, I need to listen to their stories and I, I let them know I understand who you are, I've been there. And then I found a way to get through it and I'll help you do that. Mm -hmm. You know, like in Vietnam, being a ranger, being out on point, you help people get where they need to go. And when people come in and talk to you and they sense the veritas in your personality and your voice, they see your accommodations on the wall, then you realize, oh, I know who I'm talking to now. This is a person who's been around. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he fought like I did once, a long time ago, or maybe fairly recently for the younger veterans. I have a number of Iraqi and Afghan vets, and uh, men and women. And uh, so it's, you know, you, you have to show people understanding empathy. You, always have, you also have to be very realistic to them about what it is that they've got and what they have to do to make it better. Mm -hmm. And uh, be candid, yet be hopeful at the same time. So if you were in Beverly Hills, I would imagine that you could s charge a lot as a psychologist or psychiatrist. Uh, how much do you charge an hour? Well, I'm a volunteer. I charge nothing, and I, I tell my I tell guys who and men and women who come to see me, uh, you know, what can I pay you, Mark? And I said, well, bring me a sandwich sometime. <laughs> you know, I work for food because <laughs> you work through lunch. Yeah, I work for lunch, and then we sit in and eat lunch together and, and and talk, and so I like to make it very human the whole experience. 
I mean, you know, I'm financially, I'm, I'm fine. I'm okay. Uh -huh. And so it, it isn't the money I'm interested in. Uh -huh. it's, it's paying back. I mean, I had it paid forward for me a long time ago. I survived just incredible experiences in Vietnam. And I've had my ups and downs since. And so for me, this is payback. And uh, I want to make sure that I get through the gate at the end of the ride. You know, whether it's Abraham, Isaac, Peter, Paul, or Mary, uh -huh. I want them to open the gate for me. I don't want to come back to the rock. Uh -huh. I want to move on. I want it, this to be the end of this part of the journey. And so to take everything I've learned and put it all together and give it to others, mm -hmm. you know, that's where I am. I'm at that place in my life. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Are you a heavy drinker at the end of the day? Well, I like to have a couple of drinks at the end of the day. <laughs> because you carry, it sounds like you carry a lot of people's burdens and frustrations and maybe your own frustration in not being able to get the system to help them. I, I appreciate a martini or a glass okay. of wine, <laughs> if that's what you're asking. With, with, your, with, with your patient, maybe. No, I, I uh, you know, I, you know, occasionally I'll have a drink with, with the guys that are, that are my friends and clients. But, you know, I go home, I'm married, I have a wife, and uh, my wife's a lawyer, and uh, we go home and, and we have a life together and we talk, and we both unwind. And uh, I'll usually have, a, uh, usually have a martini and she'll have a glass of wine, and we'll chat about things. Uh -huh. How does she feel about your work? Uh, she's very, very enthusiastic about it. Uh, she's, she's proud of what I do. She's proud of my service and the fact that I continue to serve. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a central part of our life. It, it helps keep us together. Have I told you?